All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I just want to get started here. My name is Anna Pernas. I'm the Director of Conservation and Education at the Preservation Resource Center. Uh, we are a local nonprofit with our mission to preserve the New Orleans historic architecture, neighborhoods, and cultural identity through collaboration, empowerment, and service to our community. Uh, I'm here now with Ed Freytag from the city of New Orleans. I'll get to that, but first I'm gonna let you know, give you a little bit more information about the Preservation Resource Center's upcoming events. It's really important for us to get your, um, you get you to join our, our membership and, and watch our YouTubes, become a part of our, our, our membership and get magazines. And, um, you know, we have a lot of interesting things coming in this June. Please tune in for the exciting slate of a lot of virtual programming and some um, shotgun house. We have Shotgun House Month being presented by Entablature Design and Build um, and Entablature Realty. And again, we have the Maintain Right series. And this is one of our first classes for that. All the donations made from your membership will be, uh, will come from, uh, from the virtual programming will support the Revival Grants Program. Um, this series is all about an importance of maintaining historic homes, but for some in our community, repairs are out of financial reach. For them, city fines only add to the burden of the PRC and the PRC's Revival Grants Program helps step in by funding repairs to low to moderate uh, income residents who otherwise can't afford them. The program started in Cherme and has helped preserve the architecture of America's oldest African-American neighborhood and improve the lives of dozen families since 2019. So all donations that are made through your memberships or um, through you know, joining us for the Shotgun House Month, um, we would really appreciate to make, make this Revival Grants program grow and expand throughout our city. Um, with me tonight is um, Ed Freytag from the New Orleans Mosquito Termite and Rodent Control Board joining us. He's been with the city for over 30 years working in mosquito control and termite control. He also is the in-house photographer using all his own videos and photos for the presentation tonight. He will be discussing the termite identification and biology while stressing the importance of annual inspections and termite treatment. A homeowner will learn the difference between wood rot and termite damage and when to call a professional. This is one of the many Maintained Right virtual class series with the generous support from the Louisiana State Historic Preservation Office and the Joanna Favreau Fund for Historic Preservation of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. The PRC is proud to be a resource for homeowners to empower them with the knowledge to spot potential problems for their historic homes and find ways to address them, including who to call when problems require a professional. The Maintain Right series will continue through, through the month of June and we'll be launching short videos on YouTube and Facebook later on. And Ed, I'm gonna let you get started and, um, and we'll have a short Q&A at the end of the presentation for any questions the, the attendants might have. Okay, well, thank, thank you, you, Anna. Thank Appreciate you. it. And again, thank you for reminding me to, uh, to share this information. Let me go ahead and share my screen for the PowerPoint presentation. So uh, today we're gonna be talking about termites, uh, specifically mostly about Formosan termites, because that's the termite that we're all very concerned about. So um, to get started here, let's, let's see what we're going to be talking about. Um, let's go to the next slide here. Come on, takes a second. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we're going to be talking about wood destroying organisms uh, in your home. If you're going to spend some time termite biology because that's that's really important. If you don't know the, the the beast, then you don't know what to do with it. We're going to learn how to identify the different kinds of termites. We're going to learn about conducive conditions, the things that you can do to prevent termites in your home, and then uh, the kinds of things that I do and the pest control companies do, which is termite inspections, but things that you can do also. And then uh, termite control methods, and towards the end, I'm going to put a summary page, kind of recap everything that we've talked about. So let's talk about wood destroying organisms, because these are the kinds of insects or things, organisms that uh, may be insects made by fungi. They either consume, they excavate, develop in, or otherwise modify the integrity of wood or wood products. So as we know, you know, all our houses are built, probably 99% of our <laughs> homes are built with wood. Now we do have a lot of brick, we have a lot of other materials in it, but because termites feed on cellulose, 
that's the problem is that we're building a lot of food for the termites. So just to reiterate though, uh, my talk is for, you know, primarily about termites, but we can't forget about all the other insects that we have around us. So we have beetles, we have carpenter bees, carpenter ants, and wasps. And all of these at some point in time are gonna use the wood in your home to probably build a nest or for shelter. So they're uninvited guests, but not necessarily as bad as the termites. So here are some pictures of some damage caused by insects. So on the upper left, that is damage caused by formals and termites. On the upper right, that is damage caused by carpenter ants. On the lower left, those are carpenter bees. And on the lower right, those are powder post beetles. So it's important to be able to acknowledge that you have an issue in your house. And if you can identify the, the damage to the kind of arthropod or insect or organism that is causing it, then you can help, well, if you have a pest control company, you can help them tell them what the problem is. So we did have in, in, in our uh, introduction talking about, you know, uh, fungal organisms or brown rot. This is something that is caused by a fungus. And whenever you have moisture in wood, if it's not preserved wood, then this fungus breaks it. Up. It, it basically feeds on it and it turns it into little square pieces like cubicle pieces. It, the wood becomes brown and crum crumbly, is brittle. It wood shrinks and collapses. So this is probably the most common cause of decay in structures. Now, remember, I used the word decay. I mean, say structural damage per se, but a house, if it's improperly enveloped where it's going to have moisture, you could lose the house just to this fungus. So it's important to keep an eye for that. But what I really want to talk to you about is termites, because we are in termite heaven. And the only other place that I've seen this as bad as we are is Hawaii. Also, I visited uh, a country, Namibia, in, in uh, Africa, and they have different kinds of termites, but they are also attack the wood. So let's talk about the biology of termites. So termites are small, they're soft-bodied, they're social insects, and live in colonies. And that is important to know because that's what makes them so effective at being destructive. So they eat anything containing cellulose. They, have, they can't actually digest the cellulose, but they have microorganisms, protozoa in their gut that breaks it down into simple sugars. They require moisture, they require warm weather. They have a caste system and division of labor. That means that you have a king, a queen, you have workers, you have soldiers, and they all work together as a family, and that's how they do the damage. They also live sheltered, usually underground, or there are some kind of termites that live in the wood and they don't have to contact the ground. And I'll be talking about those later. So I want to discuss a little bit about the biology or the life cycle. So you've probably seen some swarmers already. And so if you look in the bottom right, that's an alate or swarmer. These are reproductives that fly out of the colony, fly out of the nest, to mate, so kings and queens, um, females and males mate, and they start a new colony. So once they find a, a, a proper place, they mate, they lay eggs, and then a larva is born. The larva turns into a, soldier, a, a worker, that worker turns into a pre-soldier, and that becomes a soldier. But there's also another way they can go. They can become a worker. That worker also becomes a nymph, and then it becomes a swarmer. But again, like I said, they, they, they need a queen to, that's kind of like the president, and that's what drives the whole thing. And what happens, sometimes a queen may die. So a nymph in the colony may turn into a second form of reproductive, which turns into another queen. So it's very difficult to kill them by killing the queens because it just form more. And then sometimes they form a third form reproductive, which doesn't even have wings. So this whole life cycle kind of gives an idea as to why they swarm in this time of the year. The other thing is important to know that different termites swarm at different times of the year. For most sense, for the most part, swarm between April all the way to late June. So right now is really the time for them to swarm. 
here's a queen. Somebody from the pest control industry brought it to me. And it's very, very hard and very unusual to actually collect the queen. So the queen produces a lot of chemicals called pheromones. And they control the behavior of all the other workers and soldiers based on the pheromones it gives off. So basically, they're sort of like under brain control in a way. So she can tell them to go get more food. She can tell them to uh, build more shel shelter. It, it sold kind of like a really, really well-organized uh, machine. So now that we know a little bit more about termites, uh, we need to identify them. We need to know what kind of termites we're dealing with. So, and the reason for that is because the whole in, uh, inspection and control for termites is based on the type of termite that you're dealing with. So for instance, if you have dry wood termites, it's a completely different control method than if you have what we call subterranean termites like formosans. So we have three kinds or three groups of termites in the United States. We have what's called damp wood termites. We have them in Florida and we have them in the Pacific coast. We have dry wood termites, we're pretty much all over the country. And then we have subterranean termites of which the Formosan termites tend to be in the southernmost part of the country. This is what a damp wood termite looks like. And the thing about damp wood termites is that they eat on, as the, as the word says, damp wood or rotting logs. So they're mostly found in the forest and they don't really do any damage to structures. If they do damage, damage to structures it's because the wood is already very damaged by fungal decay. So the top one is a soldier. Notice that the head's got the large, large mandibles and the bottom is a worker. Those are the ones that actually feed on wood. We have another type of termite called a dry wood termite. These guys do not need to contact the soil. They don't need moisture like subterranean termites do. They get all their moisture from the wood and from the air. These commonly infest furniture, doors, uh, window sills, uh, joists that up, up in, the, in, the, in the lower parts of the house. They obtain the moisture from the wood in the air. Uh, they construct galleries that are, they cut right through the grain and with the grain. So knowing the type of damage they make is very important because you can determine what kind of termites you have without even actually seeing the termites. They also have very small colonies, so maybe 2,000 in, in, a, in a colony. And you could have a colony in a window, you could have a different colony in, in a desk, you could have a different colony in a door. And the problem is trying to find them is really difficult. So typically the control for these is fumigation. And I'll, I'll show you some pictures of that. So this is what they look like. And again, after a while, all of the termites kind of look the same, especially if you're not trained to look at them. But dry wood termites, when they feed on wood, they kick out their feces and there's tiny little pellets that are hard. And if you put them on the microscope, you see they have six little ridges on them because they squeeze all the moisture out of their little pellets. So that's, that's one way to, you can tell. And this is what damage looks like. So they pack all these galleries where they're fed on the wood, pack them all with pellets. The other thing they do is, as you can see, they don't have any particular shape. They go right through the grain. They, they go in every direction and make big galleries in there. So subterranean termites, as the name implies, they live in the ground. They account for probably 80% of the 5 billion plus that we spend annually in this country. The three most destructive in Louisiana are the Formosan subterranean termite, the Eastern subterranean, and the dark subterranean. So these are the three most common that we found in buildings. And believe it or not, in New Orleans, we've, it's very difficult to find the, the last two, the Eastern and dark Southern because of Formosan termite is so aggressive, it's kind of run them off. Now, I want to put this little video here of why they're called subterranean. So termites find your house by digging holes in the ground. And they do this 24 seven. They don't have, they don't take breaks. They don't sleep. So while you're sleeping, they're digging holes, finding the wood in your house. When you're working, they're digging holes, finding the wood in your house. So they're always looking for wood and they're always working. So um, 
it's, it's, it's constant. It's like having little cows in your house feeding on your, on your beams and feeding on your door and everything else. But as they're called subterranean, that's how they got, that's how they got to your house, through the soil. So can we tell them apart? Well, there's several ways you can tell them apart. So for most of the subterranean termites are on the left and native subterranean, we call them native because they were here when the Spanish came in back in the, in, in the, with the conquistadors. So they were already here. The Formosa and Termite, on the hand, that came in here after World War II in shipping containers. So if you look at the head of the soldier, the soldier is the one that's used for protection. If you look at the head, it's kind of round shape or teardrop shape on the Formosa. And on the right, that is the native subterranean uh, and it's rectangular in shape. And also the mandibles are different they're sharp on the left and kind of blunt on the right. Now, the alates or the ones that fly to reproduce, you can see that the Formosan subterranean termite has a different color and it's bigger. So it's, it's honey colored where the Eastern and the dark Southern are dark and the light Southern, which is a really, really tiny termite, you, you can hardly ever see it in a building. It, it's mostly out in, in the woods. And then the sub Formosan subterranean termite, if you put it in the microscope, you see that their wings have little tiny hairs in them. So there's, there's several distinct characteristics that uh, make a Formosan different. The other thing is they have a lot of uh, soldiers. You can see this is in a tree. I broke the, the mud and a whole bunch of soldiers came out. And they will stick to your finger with their mandibles. And they're not gonna draw blood, but that's something that's very distinctive of Formosan termites. And they also have a hole in their head called a fontanelle. And I have a video of, of showing why they have that is a defense mechanism. And you can see the one in the middle attacking a fire ant and they have this Elmer's glue, so what I call is really sticky material. It's not toxic, but it's so sticky that that fire ant just can't function. It can't sting and it can't bite. So that's a defense mechanism that the Formosan soldier has. And the native subterraneans don't have that. So you have probably seen this already. I was running in the afternoon and the evening, and this is what I ran to through a bunch of Formosans. Formosan termites swarm usually on a warm day in the evening, about an hour after sundown. And it has to be humid, and usually after we had a little bit of rain. So that's what they do. The, the, what we call them swarmers, the king and queens and reproductives. That's what they do in order to get another colony going. And this is the kind of damage you get from Formosan termites. And this doesn't take a long time because the Formosan termite colonies can get huge. They can get into millions. So they can do a lot of damage. And the other thing that's different is they attack live trees. They get inside the tree from the roots and they eat a tree from the inside out because the inside of the tree is actually dead wood. It's, it's called the heartwood. So all, all the live tissues on the outside, the, the dead woods on the inside, and they go through it and eat it and then eventually you have to cut the tree down. So let's talk about conducive conditions. Those are the things that make a home or structure more likely for termite attack. These are the things I look for when I do an inspection. So moisture and wood issues are the most common problems. So look around your house and look for moisture, look anything that looks like termites may be able to attack. You kind of have to think like a termite in order to see if your house is safe. So think about these things. Condensation from the air conditioner systems. It, it has moisture, they're gonna find it. Any kind of water leak, whether it's from the roof, from windows, pipes, tubs, faucets, toilets, dishwashers, any kind of leak, you have to eliminate that to prevent termites from attracting them. So planters and attached decks that are right next to the house is a big no-no. Sometimes the construction people throw wood in a crawl space or you have firewood next to the building. You have downspouts that are pushing the water towards the, the center of the house instead of away from the house. Sometimes you have stucco and siding below grade. That means it's in the ground. I'll show you a picture of that. Mulch is too close to the foundation, landscaping is too thick, and expansion joints and cold seams. So those are 10 of about 10,000 conducive conditions that I could come up with, but let me just show a few. 
railroad ties are not a good idea to put around your, your, the perimeter of your house because even though they're treated originally, over the years, the treatment leaches out and the promosin termites will actually feed on the inside. What about a whole bunch of vegetation around your house? Well, I found this big Formosa trail behind a bush on this building. You would have never seen it unless you knew what to look for. This is a royal nightmare when it comes to termites. Think about it, termites build trails, mud trails, to prevent the moisture from escaping. And when you have this thing, you're gonna have roaches, ants, other kinds of insects, uh, mice and rats using that. It looks pretty, from a landscaping point of view, it's not good to protect for, for your home. Leaky ACs are really, really notorious for leaking into the house. AC drains should be away from the building, not on the building. This is actually the uh, in Treme at the um, African American Historic Museum. And they were having problems with termites. And when I did my inspection, I went up high and saw that the, all the gutters were covered with leaves. Water was going into the building. And that's why the termites were being so active in there. Sometimes they come up through the, through the plumbing penetrations on a slab. There's always a little gap in there. And in this particular building, they had cracks in the slab, they had penetrations. Nobody went into this closet. And that's where the termites are coming from. During construction, they put um, forms and stakes, and if they leave them in there, eventually that concrete's gonna crack and the termites are gonna find their way into the building through there. And then stucco below grade, in this case, you can't see the bricks. If you can't see the bricks, you can't see the trails, which means that the termites are coming into this building, you'll never see them. So if you're a homeowner, what can you do then? How can you help yourself? Well. Mitigate moisture problems. In other words, get rid of any moisture, any leaks, um, anything that puts uh, moisture in the house is big known. So ensure the vegetation, either trees or shrubs are not growing too close to the structure. Eliminate any wood to ground contact. So nothing touching the ground directly. If your home is on a slab foundation, make sure the slab is visible around the entire perimeter. That's how we see those little trails that I showed you and avoid storing firewood next to your home. I did that myself by accident, left a bunch of firewood next to the structure. Next thing I know, I have termites, for most termites, under that firewood. And here I am the preaching to the choir. So termite inspections. This is me preparing to go under a house. If you have a pest control company and he comes to your building dressed in a nice suit and tie, Obviously, he's not going to go under the house and up in the attic, so he's not really going to do a good inspection. So I want to I want to explain something here. So there's two different kinds of inspections. A wood destroying insect or organism report is one that is done by a pest control company when you are selling or buying a house. This is requested by the lending agency to make sure they're not lending money on a structure that is completely destroyed by termites or by other organisms. On the other hand, an annual inspection is offered by the pest control company to determine if the treatment is controlling the pest or if new pests are present. So that's, that's a very good distinction because a wood destroying organism or do a destroying insulin pour, you don't normally get that from a pest control company every, every year. That's only if you're gonna sell it. Okay, and how do the termites get in the building? Well, remember, they're typically coming from the ground. So they're gonna find the slab, they're gonna find the penetrations, pipes, they're gonna find wood next to the house, they're gonna come from a tree or attack the fence. Eventually, because termites are always looking for wood, they're gonna find your home and they think that's just another tree. So they're gonna eat the, 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 the studs, they're gonna eat your roof and your furniture. When I do an inspection or when an inspector does uh, an inspection, they're really looking for termites, but not always you find them. So you can find termite parts, you find the little termite trails, you find damage, conducive conditions, moisture issues, and construction issues. So these are the kinds of things that you, know, you look for. And 
if you're going to do an, instruct, an inspection again, you need to have coveralls, you need to have flashlights, a screwdriver, something to poke around with, a ladder. I have heard so many times where they say, oh, I can't go in the, in the attic because I don't have a ladder. That's not an excuse if you're an inspector. Pencil, clipboard, graph paper, measuring tape, collecting containers. I like to collect samples, bring them and put them on the microscope, make sure that I can identify the type of termite that I have. Should have a moisture meter. Anything over 10 to 15% moisture in the wall, there's a problem, especially if you have air conditioning. And of course, it would be so nice if every time you did an inspection in the house, you could see trails like this. Nine out of 10 times, I never see the trails. They're hidden. Remember, they, they're cryptic. They don't want to be out in the open. They don't want to be exposed. So when I get up, up in the, in the attic or I'm under the, the crawl space, I'm looking for moisture. In this case, was from a faucet. And you can find old termite trails, new termite trails, fresh trails. I break them up. If I find live termites, then I know they have an infestation. But a lot of times, you have old infestations. And so you have to make that decision whether... Okay, this house had termites in the past, but it's not currently, at least during the time I inspected it, there's no termites in there. And of course, you've got to inspect the attic. This particular case, it was 150 degrees. It was in the summer. You got to go in there. You got to make sure you only spend maybe half an hour at a time. Got to get down, get some fresh water, drink, then go up there. And you got to you got to do your, your, your duty. You got to go through it and try to find where the termites are. In this case, right where my foot is on the right, there was termites in there. You can't just go in an attic with a flashlight and say, mm, no, it's fine. You really have to do it right. But there's also other tools that you can use. And we've been using the thermal cameras, uh, infrared cameras, because you can detect, I mean, you can actually see the studs, or at least you can see that the studs are there because it's transferring the, the temperature. So in this case, with this little camera, which is a FLIR 1, it's only about $250, you can actually see whether there's moisture in there. And that's what we're looking for. In this particular case here, we were doing inspection on the building and there was all kinds of problems in the walls, which without the thermal camera, you really couldn't see it. So I, I've been recommending to the pest control industry, these little cameras or even more expensive cameras because it gives you a whole new view as to what's in the walls. You can see moisture, you can see problems. This is an inspection I did on a very expensive home in Lakeview, a million dollar home. And they knew they had termites in there because some of the aliens had flown out. But they asked me, can you use your equipment, your infrared camera, and determine whether we should remove all the cabinets from the wall? After I did my inspection, I put in the report, I said, you should remove all the cabinets and explore in there. And this house had that sprayed on foam and they had this huge nest behind the cabinets, which somehow or another, the treatment didn't control. And it happens. It's just sometimes that happens. They also had foam up in the attic. And even though it's really wonderful because it's, Nice, it's only like 80 degrees up there in the summer. Uh, you can't see the wood. That means you can't see the termites unless they cut a hole through the foam. So, you know, there's a problem with foam. It's wonderful stuff. It saves you a lot on your energy bill. But at the same time, if you get termites in there, it's really, really difficult to do an inspection. And typically, you have to cut the foam to get to inspect the wood. And of course, that gets expensive because then you got to re, re, re put foam in there. We also have a, uh, an instrument called endoscope or um, um, a flexible endoscope like we have here on the left. This particular one is very expensive, $25,000. But you can buy one for about $20, $30 off the Internet, off of Google, that you connect to your phone and you actually look and see inside the wall, you know. Now, we use it a lot to look inside trees because sometimes you can't tell if a tree has termites, but watch this. So we drill a hole in the tree about 16 inches into the tree. This tree looked perfect on the outside. And this is what we found inside the tree. And this is very typical here in New Orleans that you drill the tree and there's a huge, huge colony inside the tree. So if they don't treat this tree, but you treat the house, is there a good chance they keep reinfesting your home? 
So, yeah, how'd you like to have a tree next to your house that is infested with termites like that? So it's really important. And when I give my recertification classes to the pest control industry, I always talk about termites in trees. That's the formal. So the question is, if you have an inspection, a termite inspection, does that guarantee that you have no termites? The answer for that is nah, maybe, maybe not, could be. The problem is, is again, being a cryptic insect, they have, they don't want, they're not out in the open. So even with all these instruments that I mentioned, it's very difficult to find them. And a lot of times you can't find them. It's happened to me with all those instruments that I had. I'd said, I can't find them at this time. And they called me a month later and said, well, they're swarming right now. So yeah, it happens. But even if you don't find any termites, they could invade your home the next day. So a termite inspector is only good for that day, pretty much. That's the way I look at it. But it's better than that knowing whether it's termites or not. Okay, so you found termites. Let's say you found them because they're swarming or the pest control inspector found them. Okay, let's just say you found them. It's no time to panic. So you need to contact a pest control professional that is licensed in, in the structural pest control business. You need to resist the urge to spray them with a bottle of Raid and to clean where the termites have been hiding because the pest control inspector needs to see that evidence to determine one, what kind of termites there were and maybe give them an idea whether it wants to use a bait, whether it wants to use a liquid to, to, to take care of them. So we always recommend don't do anything to them. Wait for the pest control uh, professional to look at it. What kind of termite control we can do then? If you're building a new house, you could build it with treated wood. It makes it more expensive, but the termites won't eat it. In, in this area, it's not required to do a pretreatment. That means you don't have to treat the soil before you put a slab. Some other states, they require it. You can either do a liquid barrier. That means you put a liquid all the way around the, the perimeter of the house, a uh, uh, termiticide. You can do a fumigation, and I'll explain why you can or can't use that for termites, uh, certain kinds of termites. You can do spot treatment, whether it means they just treat one little place, or you can use baits. So when you talk to your pest control company, if you're new to this and you just bought a house and you came from Boston or something like that, uh, you have to talk to your pest control operator and see what options you have. So if you put a liquid barrier, a liquid termiticide, they are going to have to trench. That means remove the soil next to the perimeter of the house, put the liquid termiticide in there, put the soil back in there, and treat it. And if you have a side of the building that you have concrete, they have to drill it and have to put the chemical in there. That is to make a barrier around the whole perimeter of, of your structure. Sometimes, though, there's issues and you can't drill holes and you can't get to it. So you're leaving an area untreated, and that's typically where the termites are going to come in. I'm not going to mention all the different chemicals that we can use, but there are new chemicals now that the termites are called non-repellent, and the termites can't detect them. So they can go through the soil that's been treated and get contaminated and then bring them back to their nest and contaminate the nest mates. So these are extended action termiticides. So when you have, if you're in a, in a position when you have to have a house treated, you know, and I'll talk about this, you need to educate yourself on the different types of control methods and the different chemicals that are out there. So there's the bait systems, right? And baits are very different than liquid termiticides because now you're not treating the whole soil. You put in a plastic container that has a bait matrix that may have maybe something that kills them immediately or something that kills them later. So there's many, many different types of baits, many different types of active ingredients in there. So one, one of them kills them immediately because it's like a stomach poison or metabolic inhibitor. The other ones prevent the termites from growing because they're arthropods. They're like, they're like a, a snake or they're, they're like a, a, a crab. They have to you know, remove their shell to grow and then get another shell. So some of these chemicals prevent them from forming the shell and eventually they die. Okay, and 
you've probably seen this on a on a on a house or a building. These these um, orange or red or whatever color um, stations in there. And again, I'm not going to mention all the different brands because then I get in trouble saying, "Well, you didn't mention my brand." <laughs> so, but you know, you you talk to your pest control operator and they can guide you in the right in the right material. Sometimes they have to put in some concrete and they have these caps on. And don't forget about the trees. Um, trees have to be treated if you have termites, and there's two ways of doing it. You can put pesticide or inject a pesticide as a foam into the tree. And you might be wondering why you want to do it as a foam. Well, because we did a lot of research, and when you inject a liquid, it goes straight down, right? It, it finds the path of least resistance. But the termites have all kinds of galleries and tunnels. And when you put a foam that is like 15 times more foam than a gallon, 15 to 1 ratio, it goes all over inside the tree. It kind of coats it everywhere, right? So you get real good control as compared to just putting liquid in there. Of course, the other option you have is putting baits around the tree. And we're talking about fumigation. And I need to make this really, really clear. Fumigation is a gas. And the gas has no residual. In other words, once you lift a tent, it dissipates. It's gone. So as compared to a liquid termiticide, it might be in there in the soil for the next five or 10 years. Once they remove this tent, the fumigation gas is gone. So we use this for certain kinds of wood destroying organisms. So some of the beetles and the dry woods. Uh, uh, dry wood termites. And the reason for that is because the dry wood termites, again, they don't have contact with the soil. They live in the wood itself. So when you put a gas, this gas permeates all the structure inside and it kills them inside the wood. If you're doing this for Formosan termites or subterranean termites, well, you are going to kill the termites that are in the building, but again, their nest may be a tr in a tree. 20, 30 feet away, they could be in the soil. So once you remove that gas by removing the tent, they can come back and reinfest the house. So not recommended for Formosan or subterranean termites. This is for either beetles or dry wood termites. Okay. So know your termites real well. The same form, right? If you go to the website, any, any website that has termites, I recommend that you go to those websites that are either with EPA or some kind of government or university affiliation because they do a lot of research and they're going to publish what they found. So if they found that this chemical didn't work, that's what they're going to say. We only got 50% control. Now, they also, there's a lot of pictures, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of videos on YouTube showing the termites, different species and all that. So you just have to be careful that you're not going to a site where they're just trying to sell you something quick. Uh, I remember seeing a bunch of websites where they had uh, electronic devices that were guaranteed to scare the cockroach, the mice, and the termites away. And we tested them. And what we found was that they were pretty good as a selling device, but they didn't scare anything away. So you got to be aware of those kinds of things. So if you're, you could try it, but the research shows that they didn't work. So be able to identify termite signs and the damage. Again, you see the little trails, you can take a screwdriver and break it and you're going to see the termites in there all right now you may not know whether they're from Ozen or they're sub uh, native subterraneans but that would be the time to call your pest control operator and if you don't have a company that's the time to call them and say look i have a problem i need to have an inspection so then you come to get the inspection right so typically the inspection is free because that's one way that they can get in the foot in your door and saying, yes, you have Formosan termites, you probably have some damage here, 
if you don't have a contract, then we need to get you going on a contract. So contracts are kind of, um, you know, every company has kind of their own contract, but they all kind of have the same wordage in there. But they have to, if they're going to treat your home, you, they have to, by law, the Louisiana Department of Agriculture and Forestry, yeah, and the, uh, so they they have to review those contracts, right? And that is a binding contract. So when you get into a contract with a pest control company, make a lot of questions, right? This is the time to ask them, um, you know, have you had any complaints? Maybe review them on, on the better business or talk to your neighbors. Find out if, if, if this is a reliable a company. Uh, most of them are. But you just have to be aware, you know, if, if they're out of state, maybe they're even not licensed to, to, to treat your house in the state. Okay, mitigate conducive conditions. If you have a leak in a house, don't wait several months to get it fixed. Again, termites are going to look for those, those wet areas. That's, that's what they look, that's what they look for, that's what they need. So if you have any kind of conducive conditions, uh, mulch is up high against the wall. If you have a bunch of debris, a lot of wood under, under the crawl space, those are conducive conditions. Remember, we talked about all those. So you can do a lot to get rid of this conducive conditions on your own. You don't have to wait for the pest control company to tell you you should remove that. So um, if they tell you that you have to control the moisture from a leak in the roof, you need to do it because the contract is gonna say that, that the homeowner needs to do the mitigation for conducive conditions. If, if you don't follow that, you may end up with a problem and you may end up in court with your pest control company, but they're correct. They told you you need to reduce the moisture and you didn't do it. So again, pay attention to what they, what they say. So contact your pest control company, right? Who do you call? Well, again, like I said, you need to find out which company it's it's it's, it's well, you know, it's, it's got good records, it's got good report, it hasn't had a whole lot of complaints. But you also have to remember that you have to realize that the Formosa termites and these termites are really, really good at hiding. So um there's always that possibility that even though they did the best job they could do, and that happens to us once in a while, you know, us the experts, right? Where we did everything by the book, we did everything correct, and a year later we we have termites again. So what happened? And that's what we have to do the you know the the inspection, try to find out okay what happened here. Discuss the treatment option with your pest control company. Right. Once you select the company and, and you, you can interview several companies and you might get a better feeling for one than the other. So discuss the treatment options. Do is, is your house raised or are you on a slab? Are you close to water? Because some chemicals you can't use them because they're too close to water. They have restrictions and you should be able to tell them what chemical you for them to tell you what chemical they're going to use, how they're going to treat it. Uh, do they have to remove the bushes to make that, you know, that trench in, in there? What kind of damage is going to happen? And sometimes they have to drill holes, right? Um, so don't be afraid to ask questions to the pest control company because, after all, I mean, it's it's your your your, your prized possession. Now. When we spend more on a on a house than we do on anything else, right? That is our investment, and we don't want the termites to care to to damage it because. Let's say they get in and they damage a wall. Now you're looking maybe twenty, thirty thousand dollars in repairs. So look at that contract very carefully. Maybe even have somebody explain it to you. Because I had to explain this to a person who came from up north. I think it was from Michigan. And they moved down here. They bought a house, and they got a contract with a pesto company. They didn't understand that the contract, what it covers is retreatment if the termites come back. It doesn't cover the damage 
unless they offer a damage guarantee. So the contract's not going to have that unless you specifically ask for it. And not every company has a damage guarantee. And even with that, you have to make sure that you read the fine print because if they did a liquid treatment around the perimeter of the house and the termites started from the ground, not from the ground from up high, because for most of the termites, sometimes if there's moisture in there, can start a colony with that soil contact. They might say, well, this is not covered because you have a ground treatment and the termites come up from up high. So read the contract really well. Okay, I know there's a lot of stuff in there, but that way you avoid surprises. So discuss treatment options. You may want a liquid treatment. You may want a bait. It all depends on what you feel comfortable. It all depends. Again, read read whatever you can on the internet, or, you know, like I said, from government agencies or from universities and see based on your, your situation, what works best. Okay. You got to maintain a very good working relationship with your company. It, it's, it's two ways. So if you see something that look suspicious, maybe it's termites, maybe some other insect, call them, you know, they'd be more than glad to come over and take a look at it. Uh, maybe you see that there's some moisture, you got to take care of it. It's going to be in the, in the contract that said, you got to take care of all these conducive conditions. If they treat the building, your structure with a liquid tomato side and you have a big dog and the dog, that dog likes to big, make big holes, and they disrupt the soil they treated, you just voided the contract, okay? Because you broke that barrier. And if the termites get in, and it's because your dog broke that barrier, yeah, you're, you're gonna be kinda in trouble. You're not gonna have much to stand on from that. So keep a good relationship with your company. I have been able to work with homeowners and pest control companies where they were at each other's throat because they couldn't agree the termites came back and they wanted to fire the company. They said, no, we did everything we could. So sometimes they call us up and we go and take a look and say, well, this is what happened. Your company did everything correct. So yeah, um, if, if you have a really good relationship with your company, they're gonna treat you well. So it's, it's gotta go both ways. And finally, you need to get an annual inspection. And if they didn't come every year, you need to call them. Say, look, it's been 12 months since you were here. It's, it's time for you guys to come back and take a look at it. A lot of people are under the assumption that they're going to treat it every year. And again, if you have the information, you can request the, what's called a label from the pest control company. That's the instructions for the chemical they put in there. So it might say in there that is good for five years, right? So they don't have to treat it every year. But if they have to be a break and they got some termites in there, they may have to retreat it. So it, it's, it all depends on pest control company that you have. Some may charge you a, a small fee, some may charge you a full fee. I don't know. I don't work, being, being in, in the government, I don't work like that. But I do know that I get involved sometimes when there's some litigation or there are issues where they can't figure out where these termites are coming from and why they keep having these uh, issues. Uh, sometimes we even get calls from as far away as, as Texas and as far away as Alabama to look at a building because somehow they heard about us that we do special type of termite um, inspections using infrared cameras and all these fancy equipment. But even sometimes we can't find the termites. So again, get the annual inspection. Um, make sure you keep a good relationship with your pest control company. Make sure that if you see something that doesn't look right, you call them right away. Um, and you sh should be able to stay on top of any damage like that. So let me see if I got another slide in here. So I think with that, um, Again, I didn't want to go into all the detail about, about the different types of chemicals 
because that's really the job of that pest control company. They're going to, I mean, I'm the one that sometimes has to teach them all that because we, we they have to recertify every year. Um, the companies, because of the way the law is written in here with the Louisiana Department of Agriculture Forestry, they have to recertify their, their um, technicians every year. And the licensees or the owners, they have the, the license to own a termite um, or a pest control company. Every three years, they have to take a class, an eight-hour class, and recertify. That keeps them fresh. It's kind of like your driver's license, right? Uh, except that you don't do a test. You basically sit for eight hours and listen to me talk about inspections or, or biology. That kind of, so this is a refresher course. So they stay on top. And there's magazines and there's all constant journals that they read. They stay on top of things. Pest, uh, the, the industry, it's every year is coming up with new materials. Every year is coming with new baits and new, new features. Uh, they improve on them. So we also try to stay on top of that. We do research for all these uh, materials. So we try to, when, when we give our talks, we try to give you give you the update thing. But in this particular, in this particular talk today, I think I just kind of wanted to open up your eyes to how the termite and your home relationship, how, how it works out. Termites don't think of your home as a um, monetary value. They think of your home as a sandwich because they're always hungry for wood. And if they can't find a tree to eat, they're going to find your home. That's that's what they're looking for. So um, we have to keep those termites for eating your home. The pets can accommodate a good job to do that. And they do a very, very good job. Right. So if you don't have a contract on your home or in your building and you live in New Orleans, Orleans Parish or Jefferson Parish, you're kind of like playing Russian roulette. We have a saying in the pest control industry, if you don't have termites, you will at some point in time. It's just a matter of time. I have seen homes that they're not six months old and termites already attacked them because they decided, well, we don't need a pretreatment. It's okay, we, we, we can deal with that. So again, the more you know about termites, the more you can protect your home. I think with that, I'm going to call for for quits here. <laughs> yeah. No, you did. This is awesome. I, I I truly learned a lot of new things today. And I just wanted to just reiterate how you said just looking out for those little signs of water damage or the little pellets or anything like that is just so important for that maintenance and getting to it before there's really a big problem. And finding Correct. out that the framing is all, you know, destroyed and having to be replaced. And, and I think with one of the things that you did touch on with spray foam is that it's an easy fix for the insulation for your house, but really for these old historic uh, wood framed buildings, it's, it could be very damaging because it traps that wood. Correct. It traps that moisture, sorry. And, and you can't get to that inspection. The inspection isn't as accurate as it can be because it's kind of covered in this sticky stuff now. And so it, and it's, it's the same it's the same with the old historic buildings. They have a brick facade and they've made the mistake of putting a cement covering over it. Right. So now it doesn't breathe and it has different breaking points. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, these old buildings tend to move. Right. Mm -hmm. And they breathe. And now they, they cover it with a cement. And now the bricks crack on the inside. Yeah. They sweat. And yet, and that's not good for the building. And, and now you're covering the bricks and you can't see if there's termite trails in there, right? I've right. seen a lot of that in city buildings. So yeah, I, yeah. I, I, that's, and that's a whole different other thing when it comes to historic buildings and the issues when you're trying to fix buildings, but you're not following the proper protocol. Right. Yeah. You have to think of it as kind of an organism because you affect one thing on it, then it's going to, you know, create, it could create other problems. And right. we actually will be touching on, um, we'll have a, a class later this month on energy efficiency where the discussion of what types of insulation work when, and, you know, letting that building breathe is just so important. Cause again, trapping that moisture, letting vegetation grow, letting termites just kind of have a place to live. You're, in, you're creating a, a nice little cozy home for them pretty much. Correct.
That's right. And so, and I, and I think we have a good amount of questions here that I okay. that touches a lot on. Um, we got a good. Um, let me see. Where we begin now. I think you um, you touched on a lot of stuff that people are now interested in, and I, of course, the first one has to be about the swarms because we're so used to seeing that. And I think we, we there was one recently. So you know, a lot of there was I think two two people here that were just concerned that if you know after a swarm then they are finding dead termites in their home do they should there be a pro, is that a concern they should they should have should they call an inspector out or is that you know if, is that if, well here's what happens when they swarm for most the termites are attracted to light native subterraneans are not attracted to light in the swarm during the day but for most of the swarm in the evening so they are gonna if you have a door open or if you have a window with a small crack they're gonna get in it's almost impossible to prevent it from getting in. So if you get 20 termites inside the house, you don't have a termite infestation. If you have 2,000 inside the house, I think you have a problem. Yeah, that's when you got to call. So you got to have, you got to take that into account. Is that um, sometimes you know we go into this panic mode when we see termites inside the house. And you can always call the company and say, look, I see termites inside the house. They'd be more than, more than happy to come over and, and take a look. You know, it's it's better to be safe than sorry. Yes, I do agree with that. Yeah. And so um, we have another person here with Ed. Say, they say, we bought a new house last month. We've noticed that with the swarms that termites have been entering our home. So they kind of have that same concern. But every morning after a swarm, we have found dead termites. So really, it's not that you're finding dead termites. It's really when you, what should they be looking for to know that the house is actually getting damaged by those termites? Well, they should be looking for moisture. So termites need moisture. And that's why you see all those dead swarms. Because if they don't find a moist place, normally they go in the soil, dig a hole, and the king and the queen, uh, build a little chamber and they mate and then they lay eggs and five years later you have a big colony. So if they can't find moisture, they desiccate. They desiccate very easy. Or they get eaten by lizards, they get eaten by cockroaches. So a lot of things that eat them because they're chock full of fat and protein, <laughs> right? But uh, I think if, if, if you mitigate any conducive conditions, um, like if you have a lot of vegetation and it's very moist on the wall, anything that lands in there that has been flying the swarmers, they can find out a lot better place to start a colony in there. So that's why conducive conditions, I spend a lot of time on that. It's yeah. very important. That's great. Um, we have uh, two more, but, oh no, a couple more actually. They just keep coming in as we continue going. Well, um, that's all right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I guess we're talking about the trees. I think it's really important to know. I mean, my husband's an arborist, so I always hear about oh, okay. the, the live oaks or the oaks that have ter they'll find the termites in them, and it's always so interesting to me. But um, we had someone that was wondering: Is it safe to cut down a tree if you don't know the status of the termites in it? Would they be released in a sense during the removal, or would you recommend an inspection before the tree removal? I always recommend an inspection. Because here, this, this is what happens. So the termites, they're in their native habitat, which is a tree. That's where they normally feed in. But a lot of times they haul the tree and they fill it up with mud, but the queen is probably not in there. The queen is probably at the base of the tree. And that's where most of the termites are going to be. So when you cut the tree and then grind it up, you really haven't removed the colony. They're still there. So they're going to stay there for a while until it run out of you know, roots and food in there, and then they're going to go somewhere. And if your house is closer than the next tree, they're going to go towards your house. So what I recommend is first, if, if you if you think your term, your tree has termites, get an inspection. Um, I, I have taught the pest control industry how to inspect for, for termites and trees. And then they can treat that tree with a foam system prior to cutting it. So if you can mitigate that colony or kill that colony before you cut the tree down, then your chances are much higher that they're not gonna migrate to your house. So I always recommend if you can afford it, treat the tree first before cutting it. Yeah. And then um, this same person has said, um, I've heard a lot about orange oil treatments. What is your experience with um, how they manage termite infestations in homes? We actually have tested that and 
it can kill termites, but it's not going to really kill the colony per se. And it's not going to prevent infestation in your home. So um, not as far as I know, nobody's using that in, in, in a, you know, in a big fashion. Right. So. Okay. And we have, um, what is the cost range for subterranean termite treatment? Is it more cost effective to just treat every couple of years for them instead of signing a contract? I don't recommend home treatment, doing it by yourself, because you just don't, a homeowner just doesn't have the experience to do it right. Um, I mean, the pest control industry, that's what they do. That's what, it, that's what we teach them to do, right? To do it the right way. So a lot of people think they're saving money by doing it themselves. They, they go to, I don't know, maybe Walmart and buy something that says it will kill termites. But maybe five years down the road, they got $50,000 of damage because they didn't get an inspection from uh, a licensed or certified inspector. So it's, I think it's very risky. It, it's like not having flood insurance. Yeah, most of the <laughs> time you get away with it until you get another Katrina, right? So my response to that is you really should get a contract in, in this part of the country. Yeah. And then... Um... It looks like we've got, let's see, should, should you worry about soil treatment if your water is provided by a well? That, the way the chemicals are designed is to bind to the soil and not to leach out. A well probably is gonna be 50 feet down. And when we treat the soil with the chemicals designed for termitis, as termiticides, they don't migrate very far. They stay within that treatment zone. That's what they're designed to do. So they bind with the, the soil, the particles in there, and they stay there for a long time. Now they do have a half-life, so maybe after five years, only 50% of the material is still there. But that's why we um, they banned chlordane because it stayed in soil for 50 years. So yeah, that's why it's, it's off the market. So is there enough moisture from leaks? Do subterranean termites not need to have a ground contract? If you have, if you have a, a substantial leak, uh, maybe even from the air conditioner, there's just the moisture in that. If they can constantly get the moisture, they don't have to go to the soil. So okay. that's one thing about the Formosa termites. If, if you have a leak upstairs, and it doesn't have to be a really big leak, just enough for them to constantly get moisture. Right. So it sounds like if if you can find that the nest or the termites are concentrated in that one section where the leaks are, where the leak is, let's say, would I think the homeowner is wondering, like, would you still have to worry about getting a contract, like a ground treatment for the house? Yeah, because that's the only place you found them. That doesn't mean they're not right. on the other side. You know, they prefer areas that have moisture. That doesn't mean they're not going to eat the rest of the house. Right. I mean, they, they go back and forth. Um, bring the moisture to the nest. So, I mean, I, I've found it in places where there's no moisture. So it's, it's I mean, it, typically you find moisture, but that, not always. Right. Kind of, I'm just, I'm kind of combing through. Some of them are a little bit very similar to what we've already discussed. And I want to be <laughs> respectful of your time too, because I know that, um, oh no! It's getting late. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Careful what you ask for. We'll be here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have to put my timer on because I can speak for hours. No, no, I don't think you did great. Um, so let's see. We did the cost already. A little bit. Um, well, did we touch on the costs? We talked about the termite. Um, yeah, I guess it was. This was asking if every couple of years or signing a contract. But what I've learned with um, the revival grants program, you know, we're actually putting people's houses under termite contracts. We're finding that these homes have really had not had any maintenance in years. And so putting oh, them under okay. that, giving them that long-term protection was also an important part of this program because mm -hmm. we're, you know, we're putting them under contract doing that initial treatment, which I, you know, they you know, the price is going to range depending on the property and the damage and everything. And then the yearly, I mean, the month, sorry, the yearly, um, renewal is only you know between a hundred a couple hundred dollars it was it wasn't too bad and I think if like yeah. you're 
you're stating, it's so important to kind of maintain that, that, you know, it's really worth those, those, that time yeah. and money. Typically you, you get charged the highest amount during the treatment. Right. Because it's a labor involved to, to do the, either the installation of the bait stations or the digging of the trenches and putting the chemical. After that, you have what's called a maintenance fee. Mm -hmm. So every year you got to pay whatever, you know, it is dependent and it's yeah, going to be yes. dependent on the linear footage, the perimeter of right. your property and whether it's one floor or two floors. So, yeah. I mean, they, every company is going to charge slightly different, obviously. So um, there's no set rule, but, right. you know, you, and you can compare prices. You can have, if you're looking for a new contract, you can have somebody come in, measure it, and they give you an estimate. Right. Yeah. And so um, how effective are termite shields on pillars of raised homes? Okay. I didn't cover that part um, because it's something that you really can't do. That's that's built. That's put into, into the house. So termite shields, let me explain what they do. So a termite shield prevents termites from coming through a pillar and going directly into the wood because then you won't see the trails. Or if they come in through the pillars, if it's, a, let's say, a, a wooden pillar, if that, if that joist was directly on top of that pillar, they can come in through the middle, into the wood, and you never see them. So those shields, what they do is they force them to come around, and you can see their trails. So mm -hmm. that's really all they're for, just so yeah. you can force them to, to, to show themselves. Right. Uh, we have, so are there treatment chemicals that can be used that are less toxic to human health? Yeah, we have, I, I think you saw on one of my slides, and I do that on purpose a lot of times, he didn't, wasn't covered with anything. He didn't have a respirator, he didn't have gloves, he didn't have anything. Mm -hmm. It's because he was using a chemical that is very, very safe. And the label requires no PP or personal protective equipment. So some of them are a lot hotter. They have a higher, you know, danger um, to human. So that's what a lot of these companies are trying to do, trying to come up with chemicals that are very effective, but yet less toxic to humans, right? And that's, you can request the label from your pest control come say, look, I know you put in this material, but can you give me a label? I need, I need to know, know how toxic it is. This, is there a problem with the kids? Is there a problem with the dogs or pets? Contamination of, of groundwater. It's all in the label. And you can find it on the internet too. Yeah. And um, I, just close to that is, uh, if, is there any natural deterrent to the swarmers? I think that would be a very popular in New Orleans. Yeah, you know, the, the, there's a, a misconception that if you turn the lights out, they won't yeah. land on your, but it, you're going to have less of them land on your home, but they're still going to land on your home because mm -hmm. they're, they're, the, way, the reason they swarm is to meet with other colony members so that they have a little bit more diverse genetic makeup. I mean, that's just natural for them to do that, but they get attracted to light but in the forest, there's no lights, right? They just fly in every direction. So the ones that didn't go to the light come to your house, land on the roof, land on the windows, and try to find a place to start a colony. Yes. So turn the lights off. We'll, we'll prevent hundreds and hundreds of them to come, but they're still going to land on your house regardless. Yes. It's just for a couple nights. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So we have, a, this is a good one, kind of, a, the, is a treated wood privacy fence that makes contact with a corner of a house considered a mitigating factor? Um, the treated wood will prevent the termites from eating that wood, but it could create a, I guess, a path. Right, like a little um, highway. The fence to the house. Right, so mm -hmm. just, that's why we say no wood to ground contact. So if you're raised, and you have a fence all the way to the house, they could use that fence as a way to, to, to get into the house. We've seen that a lot. We, we've, especially if you have like a fence that is, this is the weirdest thing. They had a fence covered on EFIS, which is that exterior foam insulating system. Mm 
-hmm. and the termites went in inside the ephus and went to the house through the fence. Yeah. They didn't want the ephus. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't need it, but they do chew through it. Right. Right. And uh, they, they'll create cart nest in there. Yeah. So just a just a few more. Um, and then we'll, we'll let you go. But um, okay. so this is uh, without an endoscope, are there any visible signs that a tree is infested? Yes. Uh, I actually have a whole one hour presentation on, on tree inspections and treatments. You can look for those mud trails. You're at the base of the tree, by the soil, or in the bark. With Formosan termites, if they're inside the tree, they're going to swarm from that tree. So what they do is what we call swarming structures. They make these, it almost look like coral, uh, all this mud, kind of weird looking. And during the swarming season, they build these so they can swarm from there. And before they swarm, they just load it with soldiers. So yeah, you, you can, if it's infested, you will have some external, usually you have some external trails. All right, uh, we've got, um, what can you tell us about the termite program that used to be in the French Quarter? That was called um, Operation Full Stop. When the money dried up, so did the program. So what that did, we were testing as, as part of that uh, Operation Full Stop, if you can reduce Formosan termite pressure in a large area by making sure every structure got treated. It was called an area-wide program. And you can do that in a neighborhood if all the, um, if, if you have, especially if you have a, a homeowners association, if they have a meeting, they could call mosquito control. We can, I can come in and give a talk about termos like I did today. And they can go get together and everybody says, we're gonna treat every home. We're gonna make sure everybody treats the home. And that can create a dead zone for termites. And that's really called area-wide treatment. So instead of having one house treatment, two houses with no treatment, one mm -hmm. house treatment, you know, termites are going to find places to live if, if the houses aren't treated. Yeah, so. yeah, definitely. Then one more French Quarter uh, question. What is a treatment that can inject into the brick wall support beams in a French Quarter house interior? There are many chemicals you can do that. You have to drill into the brick, into the mortar part. Um, again, if the label says you can use it indoors, then you can use it indoors. But if it says for exterior use only, if you're, that's why it's important to have the label because um, if, if the pest control technician did not read the label and is injecting chemical inside and it's not labeled for that, that could be cause for real trouble. So uh, as, as a homeowner, you know, you've, you've got to be informed. You, you need to know what they're putting and whether they're putting it properly in, in the right place. So, and then you can always call the Louisiana uh, Structural Pest Control Commission. Every, every so many parishes they have a, a person in charge in there and here in New Orleans, they, they're, um, they're in the, the USDA building there in City Park, but they have a phone number you can call and you can talk to them like and talk to me. They're more into the, the, the regulation, uh, more into the biology and the research, but they know every rule that's been written yeah. and pretty much the labels for almost all the termiocytes. So my recommendation would be to, to, to contact them and, and, and ask, have, have, you know, ask them questions too. Yeah, definitely. I wanna thank you again so much. Um, I've worked gotten a lot of thank yous. They're very, a lot of people are saying this is a great informative session and event. I think we could literally, we could really be here all night talking about termites, especially this time of year. Cause I this know- This time of year, are, yes. Are definitely starting to notice either the wings, the bodies, the, you know, the trails. So I really appreciate you joining us tonight. And I want to yeah, thank all the it's, attendees. It's been, a, it's been kind of a quiet swarm this year. I, I Knock on wood. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to take video of them swarming and I haven't really seen the swarms, not in my area. <laughs> so I don't know what's happened. But they, you know, I, I put my email and my phone number there. 
So I, I work for the city. I mean, uh, that's my job is to answer questions and, and help people out. We don't do treatments on private homes. We only treat city buildings and state buildings, but we do give free advice. Well, that's awesome. That's a great resource to have too. So we'll definitely share that information. And I really appreciate it again. Thank you for joining us, everybody. And uh, thank you, Ed. And I want to say oh, you're everyone have a good night. Thank you. All right.